Hi, this is Scott Bacark with Verde Property Management, here today with Matt Engel with the Engel Law Firm. Matt, how are you doing? Good. Good to be here today. All right. Awesome. Glad to have you here. And today we're going to talk about the eviction process, and we're going to break this out into three parts. One is the pre-eviction, two, eviction, and then three, post-eviction. We're going to start out with pre-eviction. So, Matt, what do you mean when you say pre-eviction? What happens? Well, pre-eviction, you know, a common question I get from landlords, investment property owners is, when should I start thinking about eviction? And the reality is, is most people wait too long. They wait until a tenant is two, three months behind. And once a tenant gets thousands of dollars behind, it's hard for them to catch up. So my, my first tip is always um, start early. Like know, knowing the process is the first part of the battle. But then number two, if a tenant gets behind and they stop communicating with you, not returning your texts or calls or giving you some sort of plan, uh, and they get a month behind, a lot of my clients, they will file. If a tenant is, is behind on a month, you know, a lot of people have a... Um, a five-day grace period or a window. Uh, most of my files come in between, you know, a little bit after the 10th. So they've given some people some time. But again, don't wait three months. You know, if it's a month in and they, are, they aren't communicating, it's probably time to start thinking about it. Well, and I agree with you there as, you know, property manager doing that, you know, this business for 20 years. Someone is not more likely to come up with three months of rent than they are with 10 days. Or, right, or, absolutely. And what we'll talk about, too, is, is part of my job at court is to try to find a solution. And most right. of the times the judges and courts, they, they push us to go out in the hallway and talk about a solution, a settlement. A settlement is basically come up with a plan to get someone caught up on rent. And, and most landlords want that. You know, you want to get your money. You don't want to have to spend the time and effort doing a turn. You'd rather get paid. And the judges don't want to kick people out on the street. So, again, we try to offer reasonable plans for people to get caught up. It's easier to do one or two months rent if it follows into the, uh, goes into the following month. It's a lot harder if they're, you know, three, four months behind. Right, right. And one thing from a property manager's perspective, we don't give a grace period. You know, the rent's due on the first, and it's late on the second. Right, and you don't have to. I mean, a lot, a lot of the form leases have a little grace period, and every tenant will, of course, take advantage of that. Um, but at the end of the day, you don't have to. But a lot of leases have that. Right, right, right. And I've seen a lot of. In fact, I've seen a lease that had an 18-day grace period. So g right. <laughs> guess what we got paid? Right, on the, on the 18th or 19th. Well, and, the, and the irony is, and you can, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, just because there's a grace period in the late fee doesn't mean you can't evict if the rent is late, correct? No, right. I mean, if, if all leases typically say rent is due on the 1st, but the late fee doesn't kick in until the 5th or the 6th, yeah. that doesn't mean you can't evict on the 2nd. If, if this is a chronic late payer, or if you're just tired of them, or if you know it's not going to come in, yeah, we could file on the 2nd, even if there's a, 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 a gap for the late period. Right, uh, right. The late fee. So let's, uh, let's step through the process. So pre-eviction, say I've got a tenant who... Again, for me, it's whether they have a grace period or not. We're at the 10th of the month. And we're like, okay, this tenant quit responding. They're not responding to texts, emails, whatever. What, what would, and I'm like, you know, this is a chronic late payer and I'm really just had enough. What's the first step? Well, anytime someone emails me and, or calls me and says, Matt, I, I need to think about doing an eviction, uh, I always prepare them. I, I kind of have an introductory email that says, hey, this is what I need from you. If you want me to get involved, start the eviction, you got to have these things put together, and I need to see them to give you the best advice possible. Those three things that I uh, request from a tenant are the lease, the ledger, and the rental license. And so we'll get into some of those topics in more detail, but in essence, the lease is going to have the main the main terms of the contract of the agreement. And so I can see this is when the lease started, this is how much the rent is, this is uh, um, you know, when rent is due. And so all of those things in there, um, a ledger, what's a ledger? Believe it or not, I have some landlord clients that don't really keep ledgers. They just kind of know, well, so-and-so paid in this month. And so I'm like, well, if I'm going to court and you're telling me two months of rent are due, I need a, a chart, you know, basically a, a, almost like a checkbook register that basically says, hey, uh, this is how much was paid in each month and this is how much they didn't pay because that's what the judges want to know. In the old days, you could go in and say, tenant owes $4,000 and just leave it at that and, and not have to explain what it's from. But nowadays when you go into court, you've got to list every single month that was paid and wasn't paid because those judges want to know. Is it, did they pay in December or did they not pay in December? Have they paid January? And part of that goes into the lease as well, right? That is astounding to me because there's so many uh, online solutions now that, you know, basically are, are almost free. In some cases, they are free where you can track tenant payments and stuff online, right. you know, 
virtually right up to the second and give your tenants access. You know, we use one uh, solution called Buildium. Mm -hmm. And is it perfect? No, but it's it's pretty easy right. to use. I can train people, to, you know, not it's not the employees I'm worried about. It's um, training uh, 100 people who own rental property with various degrees of uh, technology backgrounds, right? Right. So there's are there are like more sophisticated solutions out there, but you know, at the end of the day, like we want something that's easy to use because if it's easy to use, people will actually use it. Right. You know, and, and that's just not the landlords too; it's the tenants too. Like you want to make sure that they're logging in and, and you know have the ability to make automated payments and stuff. And, and, and most tenants want that value added to their to their uh, services, right? You yeah. want to be able to look up when you need to. How much was due? Did my payment post and those sorts of things? And it also can cut down on calls to your office, right? If you if there's a solution where the tenant can go check on their own, that's less people calling here saying, "How much do I owe?" Right? Yeah, it's just much more efficient for everybody involved and having those open and clear lines of communication. You right. Know? And so you you mentioned the ledger. Um, any fees that you can or cannot charge on the ledger? Are there limits to late fees? Is there, you know, charges eviction? Like I know a lot of people want to put an eviction admin fee on there. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of those things that I see and I, and it's a discussion I have, you know, on a weekly basis with people. And so what we get into, uh, there's several major things that are required in the lease agreement before you can even bring the eviction itself. An example, uh, there's a uh, uh, chapter 504B is kind of the, uh, the sandbox, the world of landlord tenant law. So anything that happens with respect to an eviction comes out of the laws in, in Minnesota statutes chapter 504B. Well, there's a section in 504B that says before you can even bring an eviction, you need to have provided the tenant in writing the name, address, and contact information for the authorized manager of the property, whether that's the owner or the property manager or someone of that. I mean, the idea is that if the tenant had a gripe or needed to bring something to your attention, you need to prove to the court when you file the case that the tenant had that information. So from, from a, a lease standpoint, if you look at the, the MSBA lease or the MHA, MMHA, Minnesota Multi-Housing Association, right up front in both of them it says this is the contact information for the property manager. That's why that's right at the beginning of the lease is because you can't bring an eviction unless you've provided that to the tenant beforehand. Now, I run into a lot of situations where there's an oral lease or a verbal agreement. You never got a signed lease. You know, your brother-in-law moved in and you never made him sign, something like that, right? Um, you can still bring the eviction, but you have to make an allegation in the complaint that at least 30 days prior to filing, you'd given them notice in writing of the name and contact information for the, the manager, the landlord, et cetera. Now, a lot of times that's, you know, it, it could be on your bill, your invoice. This is how much rent is due. So a lot of people stumble in like, oh, yeah, well, I sent this to him for the last six months. Great. Send it over to me. And even though you don't have a lease that has the manager information in it, at least you provided a statement that had that information. Are there guidelines around that? Can it be a P.O. box or does it have to be a physical can, cannot address? be a P.O. box. It has to be a physical address. Okay. Yeah. And so people who, you know, do this stuff on their own, I mean, again, you, you probably see the same thing. I get people who come to me who've been to LegalZoom. They try to do all their own forms. They're never Minnesota specific. They're missing these major things. Or they'll just put a cell number for the landlord or the property manager. It doesn't work. It needs to be an address. I look at some of these things at, like kind of like you look at it, life insurance. You don't need it until you need it. Right. And a lot of times, you know, you'll find the money that people allegedly save is far exceeded by the amount that they lose because of some procedural error or, you know, and unfortunately for landlords, ignorance is not a defense. Correct. When it comes to, uh, well, for anyone for that matter, <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems like it, it particularly hits uh, landlords harsh right, you know, in their pocketbook when they, uh, when they make a mistake, uh, rarely are they looked at as the knight in shining armor <laughs> right. when you go to tenant, right. tenant landlord. Court. Well, let me give you an example of, of a couple of those mistakes. Again, that relates to the lease. Uh, one of them would be late fees. So what I've seen many times in the past, someone goes to LegalZoom, they find a lease that says the late fee is $50 a day until you pay it. And they think that's awesome and they think they're going to collect on that. I'm like, going, well, you can't do that because in 504B it says the maximum amount of late fee is 8% of the unpaid rent. And so it should be 8%. So if rent is $1,000, 
and rent is due on the first and late fee kicks on the late fees 80 bucks you can't do 50 dollars a day you can't do 80 bucks at first and then 10 dollars a day i mean i've seen all kinds of crazy things what if they would put 50 dollars a day would it default back to the max or is it just kicked out completely? no it would be kicked out okay yep. and, and 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 the the tenant advocate attorneys would make would try to make arguments that you've got an illegal lease and and none of, and you know nothing else is enforceable then so it just can lead to all kinds of, of negative so. you know, unintended consequences um, when you have illegal terms in your lease and, and you know and that's a really good point like what what then would happen say someone is that that is a one-time fee right it's not cumulative or where they could say okay now you're late you're late in January so it's say they did it right it's 80 bucks then you're you didn't pay February so that's another 80 bucks but you can't go back to January's payment and say okay now it's eight percent of on top of that right because that, that's like compounding interest right. right so the purpose of the of the late fee statute is not to be a compounding deal it's right eight percent of what isn't paid on the day that rent is due so i do i still have clients who push the envelope right and they will charge eight percent of the total balance that's sitting at the end of the ledger when the late fee hits and, and if they choose to roll with that, I mean, eight out of 10 people don't know the law, so they're just going to pay it. But you got the two out of the 10 that are either going to figure it out or someone's going to catch them charging too much and it's going to cause problems. Right. And so the cleanest way to do it is just to do 8% of that month's rent. Again, example, $1,000 rent, the late fee's 80 bucks. If they don't pay February, you don't do 8% of 1,080, you just do another 80 bucks late fee that gets added to the ledger. Okay. So that's kind of how we Yeah, I felt like when that, ch there was, um, some confusion there there was a change when that statute went in place like with a lot of landlords and even property management companies i, d I don't think there's confusion anymore but um at least not in this office uh, mm -hmm. but uh but no that that's that's great clarification so you mentioned three things you want the lease you want the ledger and you want the rental license so what happens well first of all not every municipality requires a rental license correct, correct. right so Step one is to make sure if your municipality has a rental license requirement, you're in compliance as a landlord. Absolutely. So, you know, every municipality is different. Some of them require inspections, someone, some of them annual inspections. Some of them give you a grade. If you get a higher grade or a higher tier, you might not have to have a reinspection for several years. But again, part of this process and pre eviction is know what your municipality requires because right. there's some bad consequences if you don't get the rental license if it's required and that's a, a, what we've been dealing with a lot lately there's been a lot of litigation a lot of uh, tenant defenses based on this whole rental license uh, scenario basically a rental license is letting your municipality know that this is a rental property it's a way for the municipality to make money right it's another fee they can charge uh, from their standpoint their 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 claim is always which is true we want to provide safe and affordable housing to renters in our city so they want to send out an inspector but you know they've got to have an inspection team who knows what they're doing which is a whole nother uh, issue is is the city worker who comes out do they know what they're looking at do they know what's in reasonable repair uh, do they know what the building code is um, I know the city of St. Paul ran into some issues where the the city code and the inspectors were requiring things that weren't required by the Minnesota building code and there was some litigation uh, that went to the Court of Appeals and it said you know what you can't require a landlord to do something if it's not required by the state building code so that was a, a huge issue for a while I remember that yeah, yeah. and the landlords won that. yeah they, they did so the, the the you know the name of the case was uh, uh, BAM versus st. Paul BAM stands for Builders Association of Minnesota they're the ones that brought the lawsuit and that was the end result of that case because back at, like, it was just a few years ago right. the city would come in into a, a 1900 duplex and say you got to replace all the windows on the third floor because they're not big enough and people were like why are all of a sudden are we having to cut holes in these old sometimes historical homes and then I can't, it's kind of where that all started. And then the BAM decision came down and said, no, you can't, you can't all, you can't do something different than the state building. Well, because code. in a lot of, yeah, a lot of these municipalities, you had two different standards, right? You had a uh, one standard for an owner occupant and you had a completely different standard for a you know, property that was rented out to somebody. And, right. and in some cases that's still true, uh, you know, and, but you know, I know that um, the litigation was supposed to have provided some clarification to that. But, you know, I, I feel like it's really imperative that you as a property owner you know, do your homework and for the municipality you're living in just to make sure even after the inspection, say 
you know, the, the, the inspectors required to follow those guidelines. Sometimes they don't. Right. So you know, it's, it's really upon each of us individually, if you're working with a property manager, to work with your property manager to make sure, hey, like, you know, is this a legitimate repair that they're asking for? Right. It, it, and that's something, you know, there's an appeals process usually if you don't think that something should have to be done. You know, one of the f my favorites in St. Paul is, like, there's cracks in the foundation. So, the, the, you know, the, you might get something that says repair the or replace the foundation. Well, that's not viable. So you got to figure out what that is. The biggest consequence to this whole rental license situation is there's some old case law actually out of Alexandria, Minnesota, where the Court of Appeals had said that if a landlord doesn't get a rental license, if it's required by the municipality, the tenant doesn't have to pay rent. So in that case, the tenant brought a case that said, you don't have a rental license, the city requires it, and therefore I don't have to pay rent, and the judges agreed. They said, if your municipality requires a rental license and you don't have one, we're gonna deem your property isn't fit and therefore, the tenant owes no rent for the period that you didn't have a rental license. Now, that's a huge deal because wow. I still today run into landlords and owners who didn't look it up. They didn't even know that that was required. And t in today's world, in Hennepin and Ramsey County especially, every tenant who walks in is offered free legal services by legal aid. I mean, affordable housing is, is the topic of the day with all political campaigns, right. and that's where a ton of money has been poured in. And so that's the first thing these uh, legal aid attorneys will look for is, is there a rental license? Which is fine, they can. Um, but the result is that, hey, if you don't have a rental license, they're going to say no rent is due and owing. And that's a tough, that's a tough, I mean, the judges for the most part have been following it. Um, wow. Until uh, a couple years ago, there, there, there's a new case out of Egan. And the case out of Egan, they didn't have an inspection system. They just said, you got to go down to City Hall, pay your fee, and you get a rental license. It's just a piece of paper over the counter. Well, the tenant went to court, said, you know what, under this old case law, I don't have to pay any rent. Well, the Court of Appeals in the Egan case basically said, no, when the rental license is simply a piece of paper, an administrative process, you don't get out of having to pay your rent. You still owe your rent. In that case, the Egan case basically said, now if the city requires an inspection, which is related to property conditions, then, you d then, then, you, then it is contingent on that. So again, they kind of, they're parsing it out. They're trying to distinguish it um, as to if the municipality requires an inspection, which is an examination of the property conditions, and you didn't do that, you're going to be in the camp where the tenant's going to say, I don't have to pay any rent. Um, wow. So that, that's, that's the significance. Serious stuff. It like, is, right? Very serious. So, wow. So let's say that uh, what, what conditions, like obviously non-payment of rent is the main reason I believe people would file an eviction. Um, what other things do you see? Right. So, so basically there's three, there's three areas to file an eviction. The, f the first and most common is non-payment of rent. Non-payment, you didn't pay your rent and you're behind, um, and, and there's a whole section of 504B specifically that deals with non-payment of rent. The second most common reason um, is breach of lease. Breach of lease is you, you're, you know, you've done something that is in violation of your lease agreement. Loud parties, drug use, crime-free addendum, uh, too many people living there, um, or you know, tearing up the property, or things like that, breach of lease. Uh, that's number two. And then the, three, the third reason we would bring an eviction is what we would call for holdover. Holdover is simply, I gave you written notice that you were supposed to be out at the end of January and you didn't leave. So now I can bring an eviction for holdover because you're holding over after your notice to vacate, um, and then and that's the other reason to bring an eviction. So, okay. and percentage wise, like overwhelmingly, I would imagine. Oh, percentage wise, overwhelmingly, I would imagine it's uh, it's probably the non-payment of rent, then the behavioral issues. Right, or, I would say eighty percent of, of them are non-payment of rent, ten percent breach of lease, and ten percent holdover. So before we get to the actual eviction, so someone sends over the documents to you and they, you know, what, what's your next step? You have to do a process server or what is, what is, what is? Yeah. And so the, 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 the common documents, again, I asked for are a copy of the lease, copy of the ledger 
and the rental license. If you got everything in order, well, then I can file the eviction. Uh, you know, again, I'm checking to make sure the address is in the lease, and so we check all those boxes in order to file an eviction. Uh, but then after that, it's, okay, how much is due, what are your claims, and you put the complaint together. Uh, once the complaint is put together, then I file it with the court. Uh, all filing for attorneys, uh, e-filing is required, so we're not running down to the courthouse to file anymore. Uh, we're, we're, you know, submitting, uploading PDFs of all of our, of our documents. Uh, once you submit and pay the filing fee, uh, the filing fees in Minnesota uh, are all around 300 bucks. Depends on the county. Ramsey's 305, Hennepin's 302, Anoka's 303, uh, Dakota's 302. So basically, that's the filing fee in that given county. Um, and then the court cler clerks go to work. So at that point, they go in, they enter it in the system. It's first come, first serve. And every county has an eviction docket. And there's only so many slots. So depending on how busy they are. Uh, in that calendar, uh, you may have to wait um, three days to get a summons. You might have to wait a week to get a summons. A summons is basically the document that says, you know, Scott Bakarik, you are hereby ordered to appear in court on January 23rd at 9 a.m. And, and that's what the summons is. That's what I send to the process server, a summons and complaint. The eviction complaint and then the summons from the clerk that has the date and time of the hearing. So those are, those are, that's how the eviction process starts, is I get the information, prepare the complaint, file the complaint, and send it to the process server. Okay. And what, you mentioned some fees. The property owner cannot charge attorney fees, right? More than, what, $5? Is right. that the... So the statute has a limit, and there's some court of appeals case law, too, that basically says... Uh, in an eviction action, uh, if you're evicting someone for non-payment of rent, and the statute is 504B291, it specifically says as part of an eviction for non-payment of rent, you can ask for the rent amount, the court filing fee, and I don't know where they came up with this, $5 in attorney's fees, because that 5 bucks is well, so Well, you, you're 5 bucks an hour. Right, right? you know, right? Okay. That's, that's uh, what we think uh, they're trying to do to us. But in any case, in essence, all you can ask for is the court costs. Um, there was some other litigation as to whether even the process server was a cost uh, because the statute says cost. Well, some lawyers out there decided that, well, uh, the process server is a disbursement, and we're going to deviate between is the process server a cost and a disbursement, and they found a case in Minnesota that said any payment to someone other than the court, like a process server, Metro Legal or whatever, is a disbursement and not a cost. So now all of a sudden, oh. we, we could, that's what I used to do. I used to have the filing fee and the service of process. Well, we can't even do that anymore because the process server is a disbursement and you're not entitled to disbursements until the end of the case. Oh. So that's how they got that out. And so now we can only add the 302, 303, or 305, depending on the county, is what I can add. And the Court of Appeals came out later and says, even if your lease says, it's written in the lease that tenant will be responsible for any attorney's fees or expenses related to an eviction. Uh, the Court of Appeals said, you know what, we're not going to allow that to happen. You could, go to the, you could go to small claims court or conciliation and get it there, but you can't add it to the ledger and you can't evict on it later. Because what happened is someone got evicted and they said, I want a trial. So they went to trial and had a whole deal and there was like $3,000 in attorney's fees. So that attorney added, or the landlord added it to the ledger because they won. They won the eviction trial and said, I had to pay my lawyer three grand to go do this. Well, the Court of Appeals said, you know what? You can't add it. You can only add $5. I don't care if it costs 3000 to do it. Whoa. And so they said, you can't add it to the ledger and you can't evict it on them later because that's what the landlord did. When the tenant then paid rent the next month, what did they do with it? They applied it to the attorney's fees instead of the uh, rent. And that's what sent it up, and the Court of Appeals agreed. They, so they basically said it would be a vicious cycle if you were to force tenants to pay the attorney's fees, so we're going to stick to the $5 rule. So their only recourse is conciliation court then? Conciliation court, or I say make a note in your ledger. And if on the security deposit disposition, because the security deposit disposition says you can use the security deposit for damages beyond wear and tear, normal wear and tear, and any other obligations under the lease. Or, or, or some of the language that's in there. So that's where I chalk it up. Um, either security deposit or, again, if you have to send them to collections later. So that's kind of how I, I'm coaching my clients to deal with that with that uh, uh, decision by the Court of Appeals. Mm, that's good. That's a really good tip. Yeah. Because like, uh, I know a lot of people, they think that they can 
they can't obviously put it on the ledger, but they think they could never recover that money. Now, as a practical matter, if you've got a tenant who's not paying rent, uh, who never gets caught up, you know, it's you know, a practical matter. They might be using up that security deposit, but you never know. You never know. It's good, right. it's good to know the facts. And again, some it, it depends on the case. Not every case is going to trial. I mean, the a typical attorney's fee for my, I mean, it depends on how many files someone is sending me. It could be 300 or it could be 500 bucks, depending on what's going on. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, um, you're eventually going to have to try to get that somewhere else because if, if someone sends me a ledger and it's got old attorney's fees on it, I'm like, I can't include this in the eviction right. because of this case law. Note the file, but get it off the right. ledger. Yep. Okay. Well, you know what? That pretty much wraps up uh, section one or part one, uh, the pre-eviction process. Matt, thank you. This has been really informative. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to be back to talk about section two, which is the actual eviction. Yeah, the hearing. What happens Ooh, at hearing? At court, yeah. Yeah. Exciting stuff for sure. You don't want to miss it. We'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks.